good afternoon good afternoon good afternoon good afternoon this is yours truly minister kevin l a ewing the servant of the most high with you once again on a lovely saturday afternoon as usual to bring you the unadulterated word of god that is backed up by the scriptures that's right you heard me by the scriptures and listen listen all of you that listened last week you know what this week is about. And this week is about my topic, which is the doctrines of devils. That's right, the doctrines of devils, where we are about to expose, annihilate, obliterate, shut down that demon uh, 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 doctrine, the doctrine of covering, pastoral covering, church covering, and, 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 and spiritual mother, spiritual father. And if you're not under my ministry, you will not prosper. You're going to hell and all this foolishness. Well, your brother in Christ is here to shut that garbage down today. And anybody, 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 this is going to be my disclaimer. This is part one of a three-part series. And after this series, putting you on notice now, I'm going to have, just like every other series, an open line where people could call in. I hope that the pastors will call in and refute what I'm saying. And we're going to discuss. Now, let me tell you the guidelines here. Let me tell you my standards. I made it clear last week. Do not come to me with your church doctrine. Do not come to me with your philosophy. Do not come to me with your hypothesis. Do not come to me with philosophies and whatever they teach you in Bible school that is going contrary to God's word. Stay where you are. Do not come to me because I will not entertain you. I promised you on my last show that in my three-part series, I will be giving you a minimum of 20 scriptures to support the fact, and I want you to hear me now, to support the fact that no matter where you are in the body of Christ, ultimately your head, your covering, and your protection comes only from Christ, Jesus, God. No pastor, let me make my disclaimer, let me make it clear. No pastor could cover you unless, and this is the only exception, if he or she is covering you in prayer. But in times of, you, and don't, don't come with the leadership business, don't come with that because I can deal with all of that systematically according to scripture. Not according to what Kevin believed. Everything that I'm about to say for the next two hours is going to be supported not by scriptures I'm twisting or to contort or to conform to what I want. No, 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 no. But as the scripture clearly lays out. Now, there are those who told me through the course of this week, uh, I, I don't care what I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I think you're going a little bit too far here. You shouldn't be bashing the pastors. Listen to that. Listen to that. Listen to that. I'm telling you what the scriptures say, bashing your pastor. So again, you showing me where your commitment is. So I don't need to speak to you no more. I want to speak to those who want to hear Christ's word. I want to speak to those who got more confidence in the scriptures than a human being. Now, am I saying you should not have a pastor? No, I never said that. Am I saying you should not have a church? I never said that. Go under over any one of my recordings. However, what I did say, you do not have to have a pastor, neither do you have to be a part of a church for a covering, because Jesus Christ did that for you when he shed his blood on Calvary. No pastor could do that for you. No apostle could do that for you. No teacher like myself could do that for you. No evangelist, none of them has shed their blood. And it is the blood of Jesus that covers us. So seeing that none of us have done that as it relates to the five-fold ministry, then we do not have the right, we do not have the authority, neither can we institute it. No. But what this evil demon doctrine of covering has done, it has created a government within a, the government of Christ, which we know to be a quasi-government. No, 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 no. No, God set his rules and his principles. God set the pastor, the apostle, the teacher, the evangelist, and the prophet. Did read it because they love to throw the scripture. I mean, I can get into all of that today. They like to say, well, Kevin, if you're not a part of the fivefold ministry, if you're not being led 
or under these fivefold ministry, you're in error. I in error. I in error. I in error. Let's back up. Let me just before I even jump into it. So, which prophet, which apostle, which teacher, which evangelist? Or in the next one, which one of them was Moses under? I hear crickets. I don't hear nothing. Who? Which one of them? Who? Moses was led by who? Prophet. Moses was led by who? Elijah. Who was his pastor? Who was his teacher? Who was? Didn't all of them eventually have to submit to God Almighty? So where does this new age church come in with all of these rules? And let me make this clear. The reason, the sole purpose of me doing this teaching is to really unravel the, uh, the, the, the confusion that these people that practice this, let me make this clear, foolishness have done over the years. And the, the main reason why I'm doing it is for this reason. This teaching is going to now make crystal clear to you why you are never progressing in your Christian walk. This, this teaching is going to make clear to you that you are so committed to your teacher, pastor, whomever, and you took what they told you that has nothing to do with the Bible as the ultimate authority. You serve them, you worship them, but you thought you were worshiping God. And I'm going to show you that in this particular teaching. So my disclaimer is this. Should you go to a church? Yes. Uh, should you be under a pastor, a teacher, an apostle? And everything, yes, you should. I think you should. Now, why, Kevin? Because it's not as if you contradict it. No, I'm not contradicting myself. No, you would like to make people believe that, but I'm not doing that. Let me make it clear. I am not against the church. I am not against a pastor. I'm not against a prophet, a prophet, unless they're false. I'm not against none of these fivefold ministries if they are genuinely for God. All Kevin is saying is that their role, which I'm about to show you, is not to set up hurdles for you to jump over after you've received your liberty in Christ by accepting Jesus and being covered under his blood. It's not to set up hurdles to lead you, listen carefully, to lead you to them. No, I am a teacher of the good news. My job, like I've been doing ever since, is to lead people to the scriptures which paints the perfect picture of Jesus Christ and his Father and their kingdom and the rules that they want all of those who become a part of the covenant of Christ to follow, to live not only the abundant life here, but to spend eternity in glory with him. The doctrine of covering cannot afford you that because it is a man-made doctrine. And I will give you the history on that was, that was created in 1970 under, and I want you to write this down, under the shepherd movement, where two of the people who were part of it left because they discovered now that it turned into a doctrine of devils where it was giving church leaders rule over their members, which Christ never, ever, ever, ever instituted in his word. Never, ever. And we're going to prove all of that today. All right. Now, with that said, let me just quickly go through my sponsors here. I was so anxious to get into my stuff last week that I didn't even remember this. <laughs> Can you imagine? All right, as usual, entertainment, DVD, and snacks, which is town center, right across from uh, Richie's Calypso. Their number is 352-6954. That's entertainment, DVD, and snacks, where you'll find a variety of patties, beef, jerk, and chicken patties, cheesy beef patties, spinach patties, vegetable patties, and also an assortment of uh, snacks, uh, Doritos, and... and, and, and the, the, I, listen, you can tell like old school, I'm going to say cheese doodle. They don't make cheese doodle no more. <laughs> I ain't exposing my age right here. But anyway, <laughs> the, the cheesy snacks and all that other stuff, drinks, sodas, uh, Gatorade, uh, entertainment, DVD, and snacks, uh, where uh, Angela uh, Peniman and Tony Peniman, the proprietors, would be more than happy to facilitate you guys with any form of refreshment after a long day of uh, shopping. Also, they uh, rent and sell DVD movies. They have an assortment of wonderful movies there that I strongly, strongly uh, advise that you support them. I say all the time, support those that support me because they are the ones responsible for me being on the air. So that's entertainment, DVD, and snack. Again, that's downtown. If you don't know the location, then you can give them a call at 352-6954. Also, Tico's 
fashion men's store it's a men's store and the shirt that I'm wearing right now is one of their products I love this shirt <laughs> and they're located on Kent Street and that's at the rear of the uh, post office and also across the street from the Scotia Bank their number is 352 3394 I want to ask to speak to Mr. Gary. He'll tell him Kevin send you, man. Say, man, Kevin, always talking about you on the radio, man, and I'm just tired of wearing this crayon shirt, and I need you to hook me up with a nice shirt <laughs> so I could so I could have my wife or whomever uh, give me some kind of respect. <laughs> anyway, go to Tico's Fashion for all of your men clothing attire. They have the best shirts there. Believe you me, I support them highly. I wear all their clothing. I'm very proud to wear it. Uh, Gary and his family are doing an excellent job. The the service in there is excellent. That's another reason why I love it. So I strongly, strongly suggest you visit Tico's Fashion and support their business. Then JAN Builders, General Construction Company for all your construction needs. Their numbers are 352-2432 or you can reach them on their cell phone at 533-2064. Actually, it is, I think today is the proprietor's birthday, Mr. Julian Nixon. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, sir. <laughs> so I'm sure that uh, his wife, Karen, in fact, they're having a party tonight, which I will attend. Oh, yeah. I will be there. All right. So <laughs> JN Builders General Construction Company at 352-2432 or 533-2064. You can either speak to Miss Mrs. Karen Nixon or Mr. Julian Nixon in regards to any of your uh, construction uh, needs. Then simply the best uh, multimedia center, anything to do with audio, video recording, uh, birthday, funerals, weddings, office parties, these are the people that you want to have a con conversation with. Uh, Mr. Clifford and Mrs. Krishna Bo. You can contact them at 351-6519, 351-6519. Again, for all of your video needs, maybe you're having a beach party, maybe you're having a graduation party, whatever it is, and maybe you want to do some recording with audio, or uh, you want to have you have old uh, wedding uh, VHS tapes and you want to transfer it to the, the CD or to the uh, flash drive. Well, hey, my friend Cliff will be more than happy uh, to assist you uh, with that. And with that said, with that said, I want to suggest jump straight into this teaching today and again my topic is the doctrine of devil's part one now let me be clear let me be clear i am not saying that someone is a devil yet all right let me make that clear now i say it yet because after i would have pre presented my uh, preponderance of evidence you don't play with me don't you play with me <laughs> once I would have presented my preponderance of evidence then we will use the 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 projected at whomever leader is trying to dominate you from a pulpit embarrassing you from a pulpit speaking down to you from a pulpit or getting other members who worship them to turn against you that's not a child that's not a leader of Christ that's not a pastor or teacher or prophet of God the Bible makes it clear. They are to admonish us. They are to train and to teach us not to worship them, not to gain favor and to bring division, but to condition us for ministry. You know, this is why I can't understand. You, you can't run your own house and you trying to run my life. No, you wrong. You out of order. You are totally out of order. So the first scripture I want us to look at here is first timothy and i want you to write these scriptures down because i don't want you to just take my word for it i want you to actually search the scriptures for yourself you know what i believe right don't take what i say i am not your god i am not your savior i'm not your deliverer i am like any other teacher of the gospel preacher or whomever else and our job i keep i want to make this clear our job is to direct you to christ our job is not to direct you to me those 65,000 people that follow me on YouTube, the thousands of those that follow me on Twitter and Facebook and all the other places, they, I don't want none of them to fool themselves that they're following Kevin, you know. You're following the teachings of Kevin that are saturated and based in the scriptures. The day I say anything in your hearing that cannot be supported by scripture or is contrary to scripture, Listen, I telling you run from me. In fact, I want to run from me, okay, because it's very dangerous, all right? So 
I will stick with that. We are dealing with the scriptures. We are not interested in man's theory. We are dealing with the scriptures. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter days or the last days, some shall depart from the faith. Now that's interesting. Some shall depart from the word of God. Some shall depart from the, the gospels. Some shall depart from the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Some shall depart from his rules, his principles, his laws, his commands, his precepts. He says, some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed, listen to this now, giving heed to who? Seducing spirits and doctrines of who? Devils. So there are a certain group of devils that have forged a doctrine and has handed it over to some leaders in the body of Christ, be it pastors, be it teachers like myself, be it apostles, be it evangelists or whomever. And he said, the, the one that accepted this were those, he, he, this is how he prefixed it, it was those that departed from the faith. Now, most of these, you could see them coming up now, if they haven't turned that way as yet, through their arrogance, through their know-it-all, through them being to, to, I've been to Bible college just like you. They, they believe that because they've been to college, they have a, a, a monopoly on the scriptures. They're not teachable. They believe that is either their way or no way. And they will be in the church and they will tell you, this is my church. If you don't like it, you could hit the highway or you could leave if you are not on this road. Who is this devil? How you could speak to the people of God like this? Who are you? See, this is where the haughtiness and the arrogance and the pride begin to arise. Where if you don't do what I say or submit to me or bow to me, then God will strike you down. God will poke you in your eye. You wouldn't prosper. You wouldn't go ahead. The devil is a liar. Because when I look at how my Jesus led his 12, there is nothing that what I have just said to you that resembles the teaching of Jesus Christ. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Jesus Christ was fully aware, listen to this carefully now, that Judas Iscariot will not only lead him to his death, but he knew the man was a thief stealing from the treasury of the 12. But did Jesus tell him, get out of my, my did Jesus say, uh, you will not, no, 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 no. He didn't do it. You know why he didn't do it? Because Jesus saw the bigger picture. Jesus know that all things are working together for those that love the Lord. And Judas have a part to play. Don't you play with me. Don't you play with me. Judas, so you don't condemn? Uh -uh. He let Judas remain there while he continued to heal, while he continued to preach, hoping that one day Judas would say, you know what? This is the Christ and I really should follow after him. But Judas made a decision like everybody else. All right. Unfortunately, his decision would have been an error and would have cost him his life. But Jesus never treated him any different. Jesus never stood up when he was preaching to the multitude and said, there's some among my 12. Oh, they don't support me. They're wicked and evil and speaking against the I heard what you say or they about me. Man, preach God gospel, man. What you run all this mess for? We come here to hear God word. When we want to hear gossip, we go listen to the news. Huh? So stop being mixed up and, and, and do what your role is, and that is to teach us about Jesus. Don't bring division in here. Some people in here, you know, they, they treasure their pastor. They buy me suits and give me gold teeth and short pants, and some of y'all out there, y'all don't care, but y'all, oh, what scripture that is, Sha? Show me that scripture I'm supposed to furnish you with gold teeth, please, and, 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 and give you jeans pants. Could you please get on with the word of God, sir? Because that's what I come here for. So this is what I'm saying to you. When we talk about the doctrines of devils, 
It isn't something that is thrown on that leader. No, over time, that leader be get beside themselves, like the old people say. They're not humble anymore. They're quick to down and tear down and rip up other people only to institute their rules. In fact, this is what I call it. I call it, based from where they're coming from, they're now trying to endorse a spiritual referendum as it relates to the laws of God. So what they're saying is that, you know what, put God law aside right now, because obviously that leading people to Jesus Jesus. I need people to come to me first to get to Jesus. So let me put these spiritual hurdles in their way. And anytime they get out of line, I'm going to tell them, touch not, not God's anointed and they're not submissive. And I'm going to beat them with that until that is engrafted in their cerebral cortex, that that's all they know. And they're deep, they, they're totally foolish after that. No, that person is violating your freedom in Christ Jesus, what Christ has died for. So the arrogance uh, is, it, it is the, 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 the forerunner before they introduce these doctrines of devils. So any church, any pastor, and I want to make this clear again, you could say I bash in them all I want, you want. I don't care what you think. Here's why I don't care, because those who are sold out to a person and not God will sit down and just pick out these things out of my teaching. You hear what he said about the pastor? You hear what he said about the church? No, but what about what he said about God's word? What about the scriptures he's quoting? Why don't you harp on that? No, you have now become a defender of your pastor. That's God's job. If that pastor is doing what God is supposed to, God is supposed to you, you can't defend that pastor. And again, I'm not bashing. I'm trying to get you to pull your head up out of the sand and now focus it where it should have been, which are the scriptures that the leader is supposed to be teaching you to prepare you and condition you and modify you. Listen why now, according to Ephesians 4, it says that so that you can now begin to minister to other people. And the word minister means to serve. How can you serve your fellow, uh, fellow members if your leader is bringing the division? I know some of y'all in here ain't for me. I know some of y'all in here don't like me, but you'll never prosper. How could you say that, man? You wrong. So in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, it says that now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart. Who is this some? Those who are part of obviously the body of Christ because they're saying that they're departing from the faith. So therefore, they had to once have been a part of the faith. But obviously the faith seem to be holding them back and people aren't submitting to them. So it says that they will depart from the faith. And how is this protocol going to take place? He says initially by seducing spirits. That doesn't necessarily mean by sexual whatever. No, it means that the doctrines of devils is seducing them to leave the faith and come over to this doctrine of devils. It says that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed or paying attention to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So these are doctrines that has nothing to do with the body of Christ, but it have everything to do with bringing a person glory and never ever pointing you back to Jesus Christ, right? Now, now that we understand that this doctrine of devil is instituted by devils, but handed over to those who were seduced by seducing spirits, these leaders now begin to facilitate this doctrine throughout their members. And the only thing, the only purpose that this doctrine of covering, which I'm getting to, I'm talking about primarily, the only thing that this is doing is to gain control, to manipulate and to abuse the people of God. And you have to see it this way because when you now, you don't, don't listen to me, listen to the scripture. Let's see how Jesus led his disciples. How, is, is, is there any evidence in the gospel that Jesus stood on the pulpit or stood on the boat while they were in the sea and he was ministering to the multitude where he embarrassed his disciples? Is there anywhere where he told them it's either his way or no way or they could hit the highway? Is there anywhere in the scriptures where he said, this is my church? As long as you hear, you will do it the way I say. No, you will never see it. You will never see that. And anyone, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to stop saying it. Anyone that is saying stuff like that cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ because clearly they're not following Jesus Christ's rules. So, with that said, 
The doctrine now of covering is clearly orchestrated by the doctrine of devils because there are absolutely no scriptures that can support that particular doctrine. And that is no pastor, no church could cover you. You don't need a church to cover you. You don't need a pastor to cover you. Again, I will reiterate it. Can they cover you in prayer? Yes, they're supposed to do it, all of us. The Bible says to us in Luke 18 verse 1, I think it is, it says that men are to always pray and not faint. So that's all of our jobs to pray and cover one another in prayer. All right? Now, I want us to look at another scripture now because I'm going to give you the understanding of covering in the Old Testament, and then I'm now going to take you to the New Testament as it relates to God's covering, not these man-made, Mickey Mouse made in China covering. No, 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 no. We are talking about the covering of God. That's what I want to hear. Now, bring me the scripture on that, and I will take you to one right now. Let's go now to Psalms. Let's go to Psalms 91. Psalms 91. And we ain't to obey. I know y'all like Psalms 91 and turn your Bible out on people. <laughs> we, 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 we ain't practicing no mojo here. All right? <laughs> so you could scratch it off your list right now. All right? Psalms 91. Listen to what it says. It says, He, beginning at verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, Lord, I love this. Let me read it again, because I can break it down from the Hebrew rendering of it. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 91 and verse 1. The word secret place in the Hebrew means to cover, covering, a hiding place or protection. Okay? The Hebrew word for shadow also means defense. So he who dwells under the covering of the Most High shall abide under the defense, hello, of the Almighty. Can your leader do that? All I hear is crickets. I hear nobody. Let me read it again because you might say I make it up. All right, let's go over it again. Let's read the scripture again. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That will be God. That is in Psalms 91 and verse 1. Let me read it again. This, let me read the understanding. The word or the phrase secret place, in its Hebrew rendering or meaning, it means to cover. The secret place is a place that you are covered or it's called a covering, or it's a hiding place, or protection. The Hebrew word for shadow also means defense. So he who dwells under the shadow of the Most High, which is God, I didn't see pastor, I didn't see teacher, I didn't see apostle, I didn't see evangelist. I didn't see that. So don't make up no mess here. Like I say, bring me the scripture, because I bring in you scripture. He says here, read it again, the, the word secret place in the Hebrew means to cover, to, means to cover, it means covering, it means hiding place or protection. The word, the Hebrew word for shadow also means defense. So he who dwells under the covering of the Most High shall abide under the defense of the Almighty. Listen carefully now, listen to this. The scripture does not tell us to dwell under the covering of man. Now maybe your Bible is different. And I need you to bring that Bible here that says something different. Because I will accompany you to the gas station and get a gallon of gasoline. And stop to the hardware store for some matches and burn that devil book that you would have that says otherwise. No, 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 no. Let's stick to the scripture, man. If you can get mad with Kevin, then bring a scripture that knocked us out of the ballpark. That's all I say to you. No. It's, the scripture does not tell us to dwell under the covering of man, but rather God. He is our covering. He is our protection. Let us examine the old, let, let, let us not only examine the New Testament scriptures, but now let us also address covering in the Old Testament. All right?
Good. Now, let us go here. Look at my notes here now. To uh, Corinthians chapter. That's First Corinthians chapter eleven, verses three. Then we're going to read verse seven and verse ten. All right. So write that down. First Corinthians eleven, chapter eleven. We're going to begin at verse three to verse five. Then we're going to read verse seven. Then we're going to jump to verse ten. And listen to what it says. But I want you to know that the head of every man is his pastor. That's what you read? No, no, okay. The head of every man is his apostle. No, you didn't read that. The head of every man is the teacher. That's Kevin. No, I didn't read that either. The head of every man is the evangelist. No, I didn't read that either. So where did the doctrine of covering come in where I must have the leader as the one who stands up on the pulpit? Please tell me. Because that's what I'm not reading. I'm not reading that here. What I am reading, it says, what I want to say, hold on, where is it now? But I want to say, you know, that the head of every man is, is Christ. Watch the order now. The head of the woman is who? Man. Okay. And the head of Christ is who? God. So let me see how this covering works now, because it's like an umbrella. We have God, who is the ultimate. Then we have a son, Jesus. Then we have the man. Then we have the woman. Could someone point me to the apostle in there? Could someone point me to the, to the pastor? Could someone point me to the teacher? Could someone point me to the evangelist in that order of covering according to the New Testament? You can't. You can't. So all I do is poking holes in your demon worship doctrine. That is not of God and you are misleading people. Point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Point them to the creator of all of us. Our job is to do what I'm doing right now. Teach them about Jesus and his rules and stop trying to manipulate them. Stop trying to point them back to you. Stop it. It is not of God. No. This week on my, on my Words of Wisdom feed and, and on Facebook, uh, I was having a discourse. Well, he was on the thread, this particular apostle. I wouldn't call his name. And he decided to make the fatal error of jumping into the the, the, the conversation of demons, of the doctrines of devils. And of course, he's going to defend not the word of God again. This is what I've been getting from the time I've been doing this study. They're defending their belief in a doctrine. They can't give me no scriptures. So he says to me, he says, Kevin, who is your pastor? And I wrote right under there, I said, my pastor is Jesus Christ. He wrote, and if, if any, and in fact, I snapshot it in, in case he tried to delete it. He wrote underneath there, this is sad. You all hear that? You all hear what the apostle say? I tell the apostle that my pastor was Jesus Christ. And the apostle said to Kevin, that is sad. The apostle said, I should be under a pastoral covering. But folks, I just read to you in Psalms 91 and 1, Right? And, and, and I will continue it in the, 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 the New Testament. And the Bible is unequivocally clear as it relates to the teaching of covering. Who is your covering? So why, why are you allowing these people to mislead you? Am I bashing the pastor? No, I love them. I want the best for them. If I didn't, I wouldn't be teaching what I'm teaching right now. I wouldn't make this bold move and come up against the establishment because I know the persecution, the persecution will come. It's been coming after me. But I don't care what they say or what they believe. I care what the scriptures say. What does the see? That's all I want. Yeah, you know, if you are not bringing that scripture, then you are speaking Dutch, and I don't. I could barely understand English, so Dutch is out of the question. So what I'm saying to you, bring me the scripture. So the Bible says, Behold, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonored his head. But every woman who prays or prophesied with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but, but women... But women in the is the glory of men. All right. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. And this is First Corinthians eleven, from verse three to verse five, and verse seven and to verse ten. Now, 
in that statement in the New Testament, did you see any of the five full ministries mentioned in that? That's my question. So you can't come here and say, well, what, what, what the, the, the man part of it is the no, 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 don't come with that. Get from around here. It didn't say that. Let's say what the scripture say. Let's say what the scripture says. Listen to this. The head of every man is Christ. Leaders in the church are not the head of man. We just read it. We just read it. Listen carefully. The leaders in the church is not the head of man. I just gave you the protocol that God put in place. God, Christ, man, woman. I didn't see God, pastor, or apostle, or teacher, or evangelist. No, that whoever put it that way, that's their doctrine, which we have equated to be the doctrine of devils. That is not God's order. The head of every man is Christ. Leaders in the church are not the head of man. The head of every wife is her own husband. Okay, every man who is ministering with his head, which is Christ, covered by another man. Dishonor his head, which is Christ. Man should not cover his head, which is Christ, with the covering of man, because he is the image and the glory of God. The image and the glory of God must not be covered up by the covering of a man. That's what the scripture is saying here. It says that the image and the glory of God must not be covered up by the covering of a man, which is very disrespectful. The wife of a man must be covered by her husband's authority because of the angels and because she is the glory of man. The glory of man must be covered and the glory of God left uncovered. The glory of God, the, sorry, the glory of God is covered by God himself, not a man. The glory of man, the wife or the, or the woman, is covered by her husband. Please note that a man's wife is not to be covered by another man other than her own husband. Don't tell me, uh, Sister Mary and Sister Shirley, uh, that my husband is saying he's an alcoholic. That's why my pastor covered me. Well, sweetie, the Bible don't say that. The Bible does not say that. And you are in error. And if your pastor is telling you that that is the case, he is also in error. And both of you need to repent because I just laid out the protocol. And then I went into detail as to how that covering is. That covering ain't no hat. That covering ain't no big uh, whatever you put on your head. No, we are talking about the order and protocol of God, his son Jesus, the man, and then his wife. So now where does this take us now? It now speaks about the covenant right so with this covenant now and this is why I, I put emphasis on this when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior you came into the a covenant with God all right and with that through Jesus you are also now a part of the blessings of Abraham according to Galatians chapter 3 right so you're already in this covenant right now the church now is not, let me make this clear, is not four walls. Because I can get into that too, because they like come to me, well, you know, Kevin, I hear you say you don't have a church, and you know you are not to forsake the assembly. The assembly of who? Believers or a building? See, don't you play with me, man. You, you see, I ain't your little members who you don't brainwash. No, 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 no. There's a man who's very learned in the scriptures, been studying the scriptures for years. Okay? The Bible is clear. When you, you, you accepted Christ, you came in covenant with God and his kingdom, with his son Jesus, through his son Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, we are saved. He became the ultimate sacrifice. Now that you are saved, listen carefully, listen carefully, you are now a part of the body of Christ. How is this done? Through the covenant that was established when you accepted Christ as your savior. Now, what does that mean? That means now that the body of Christ is not an organization. No, 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 no. The body of Christ is a living body. It is an organism. That is one of the first things they teach you in Bible school. I've been there, so I know. So the body of Christ is an, is a, is an organism. 
right now you guys are gathered around your radio you are gathered watching me on facebook your phone or whatever we are assembling we are not forsake we are literally fulfilling that scripture i think it's in hebrews 10 somewhere about this someone can put it on there we are fulfilling that we do not have to be in four walls to be assembled you know why because the four walls is not the church we we the body the living organism all of us who are one in Christ Jesus, we're the body. When someone stopped me throughout the course of the day and said, Brother Kevin, I had a dream, or Brother Kevin, I need some spiritual advice. You know what the scriptures say? Let me tell you what the scriptures say. Just in case you have a problem with what I just said, just now that you are a living organism. Jesus said in his word, wherever two or more of you are gathered in my name, there I am also. So if I am in here, talking to you and we're talking in jesus name is jesus not going to be there because we're not in a four wall or not in a church folks wake up you know folks i'm not trying to bash your pastor i'm not trying to tell on the church i'm trying to open your eyes so that you could begin to live the freedom in christ jesus that he died for you to have in the abundant life that was stolen from you under the rules of men that's all I'm trying. I'm not trying to be little. I'm not trying to, whatever you say I try to do, I'm not, the only thing I'm trying to do is facilitate the word of God, which is my job as a teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. What you call me, how you feel about me is irrelevant. None of that could get you or me in heaven. Let's stick to the rules. So, therefore, let me get back to my point now. Jesus Christ, whom you've made the covenant through him, you're now reconciled back to God. Jesus Christ, who was who dead, who, who, sorry, who was killed, buried, and, and raised again now. This is the one who shed his blood for you. So you're in covenant with him. Now, why am I saying all of this? I'm saying all of this because this is another evil doctrine. No church that you go to, four walls, no, 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 whatever, should be telling you in order to be a part of them, you need to come in covenant with them. You should, that should, that, you should walk away right after that. What am I coming in covenant with? Haven't I already become covenant when I became a part of the body of Christ? So what this other covenant is? Uh, you, uh, uh, and many, many of them say this on the, 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 the tele-evangelists, right? They would say, uh, uh, join us in the hand of covenant and sow a seed. I don't need to come in covenant with you to sow a seed. For what? Now let me tell you why I pounded on this because this is also a part of these false doctrine. See, understand, remember now, let's go back to my teaching in January. Uh, evil covenants being established. Remember what a covenant is, you know. It is an agreement between two or more people. But here is the catch, though. You're not just making a covenant where you sign words or agreeing to words. No, no. In that covenant, you are now surrendering your spirit. I wrote on, on my notes this morning, I said, in a covenant, your spirit is made subject to the covenant being made. Now, what does that mean? When you decide, when you decide now, you say, okay, you know what? I won't go to, to that church on the corner, the church of Christ to the third power on the corner. But the church of Christ to the third party on the corner says that, now, you could come join us, but we need you to come and covenant with us. The first thing you should say, well, for what? This is the body of Christ, right? I'm already in a covenant with the body of Christ. No, 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 for membership, no, no. Show to me in the scripture. Show me in the scripture where Matthew, Luke, John, whomever, any one of the 12 disciples had to make a covenant to be a part of Jesus' 12. Show me that. No, you can't show me that. Why am I saying this? Because you see, when you now join in covenant with that organization, not organism, because the organism is a living body, but this business over here, you are now surrendering your spirit to the covenant that you made. So you know what that means now? Now they do have the right to say to you, when you feel like leaving, you know God in you no more, they say, if you leave from here, you will not prosper. If you leave from here, you are cursed. If you leave from here and start your own church, it will never happen. And guess what? They could make that statement, and the statement is true. Guess why, though? Because you went besides yourself and Scripture and forged a covenant with them. They are no different from the secret society. They are no different from the fraternity, the sorority, and any other entity that make you sign covenants. I don't need to, if, if I want to join the Baptist church, the Pentecostal, the Catholic or whatever, why should I have to forge a covenant with you 
when if we are the body of Christ, a living organism, which all of us are to covenant with Jesus Christ to be a part of that kingdom, why is a second covenant necessary? Why? Why? See, again, I'm waking you up. I'm opening your eyes. I'm showing you how these seducing spirits come in and now begin to override you with the doctrines of devil. But you don't understand the spiritual implication behind these things that you are doing. You know why? Because your, your leader is your pastor. Your leader is your prophet. Your leader is your, is your whomever they call themselves. And yes, they are put you to lead and guide. Not to rule, not to dominate, not to insult you and embarrass you and levy curses on you if you decide to leave their organization because it's not an organism. So this is why these teachings are imperative because what it's going to show you now that now you understand why you weren't getting ahead in life. I wasn't getting ahead in life because I was committed to the rules and the regulations of men. I was I was, I was committed to, to my pastor who intimidate me from that pulpit. I scared to leave or say something. Something he said on that pulpit that is against the laws of God, but I scared to tell him because he done set all us straight that the day we don't like it, we could leave. It is the highway or, or it is his way or no way. That's a controller. That is an insecure human being who leads with fear, who leads with intimidation. It's a Jezebel spirit on that poison. And they need deliverance. They need deliverance. So now why, why am I bringing this baby home to you in this manner? Well, let's go. Let's go to 2 Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 3. Right? 2 Peter chapter 2 verse... 2 Peter chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. And again, we're going to read all the way to verse 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. They're probably saying, that's you, Kevin. <laughs> Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. That's now the doctrine of covering. That's now the doctrine of spiritual father and spiritual mother. That's now the doctrine is if, if you're not under a church, then you cannot be covered. If you're not under a pastor covering, you're uncovered. This is what this scripture is talking about. Let me start again. 2 Peter 2, beginning at verse 1 to verse 3. But there, sh but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. You hear that? But I'm not surprised because Jesus already tell you, broad is the way that would lead to destruction. Ain't much going to listen to me. You know what? Who we think he is? So whenever you overwhelm them with the truth, now they go pick up stuff that is totally irrelevant to what we're talking about. I ain't listen to him because he, he just wears size eight shoes. What I got to do with this is what I'm talking about. I ain't listen to him because uh, he, 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 his family from Texas Island. Okay, what do I have to do with the scriptures? So that is, that, is, that is doctrines of demons. When they see you poking hole in their theory, in their hypothesis, in their philosophies, now they begin to go back in your past. Oh yeah, I remember when you was four years old and used to pee bed. What, what did I have to do with the, the, the scripture? What, what, what? <laughs> oh Lord. So what I'm saying to you, because I know I can be a big topic in most churches tomorrow. What I'm saying to you, Let's get back to the scriptures. That's what I say to you know. So verse 2 of 2 Peter, chapter 2 says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That's what he's saying with me right now. Who we think he is. I can tell you why I'm a teacher of the gospel. I told that already. Verse 3 says, And through covetousness, ah, uh, yeah, greed, tingsy, mm-hmm, that's to them, tingsy, greed. And through covetousness shall they with fange words make merchandise of you. Come here. Give me the $1,000 line over here. Give me the $3 billion line there. And give me the 100 line over here. And God says he got a special blessing for you 
if you sow 33 quadrillion dollars over here what scripture that is oh i just found the scripture here it is second peter chapter 2 verse 3 and through covetousness because at this point they're cov they're, they're confident that you've bought into that 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 doctrine of devils in terms of covering and it's doing what it's supposed to do now now you can't question what they tell you even though you see it's going against the scriptures the bible says in verse 3 of second peter chapter 2 and through covetousness shall they with faint words make merchandise of you oh yeah miracle cloth jesus pillow miracle juice Miracle Kool-Aid with extra strength sweetener in it. <laughs> Boy, look here, God, you gotta come, you know. You gotta come. These people run out. <laughs> I'm telling you. And through covetousness shall they with fiend's words make merchandise of you whose judgment, I love this, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Let me make an interjection right here. I remember, yes, yeah, so I told you this story before, and I think it, it went repeating again. I remember I was to the barbershop, uh, went to get my hair cut, and there was a well-known preacher, a bishop. I know him for years. In fact, I knew this man before he even was a Christian. Many days, me, him, and my best friend used to sit and talk for hours. None of us were Christian then. He got saved, turned his life around, and rose to, 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 to bishop or whatever. And I came into the to to the to the uh, barber shop, and I was sitting down. And whenever I go to my barber shop, you know the guys always want me to talk about witchcraft and explain more about it. Now, what I didn't know is that they were probably having a conversation with this bishop. Now he knows me very well. He didn't speak to me. He didn't hail me. He said nothing, which I thought was very strange. So I sat there, and and the guys were throwing out questions, and I answered. So while he's getting his hair cut, he's totally irate. He said, "Listen to me." Now, he's not talking to me now. He's talking to the guys in there. He said, I know this man. I read his stuff in the paper, and all he has is head knowledge. So I'm humbly sitting there. I'm not saying anything. And, you know, I guess he must know what he's talking about. So anyway, he started ranting and carrying on. So after he got his hair cut, he stood up right next to me, but basically ignoring me and speaking to the guys in there. He said, let me tell you all something right now. This is the same reason why. Now he's pointing at me. He said, I don't let anything come and preach in my pulpit. My pulpit for me and my children. When I die, my children take over my church. And at this point, everybody in the barbershop was silent until one of the guys said, well, Rev, I thought you all too was on the same side. And where the embarrassment took him, he just walked off. And ever since I saw that bishop, every time I would see him, he would totally dismiss, ignore me, or turn his head. And I remember one time I bucked him in a particular store, and I said, hey, bishop, how you doing? Uh. <laughs> so what am I saying to you? Am I trying to bash the bishop? No. Am I trying to degrade him? No. Am I trying to belittle him? No. I am showing to you what doctrines of devils do. I am showing to you when you think you are above God and his people, that you make a complete fool out of yourself. I didn't say a word to him. I never refuted what he said. I never counteracted. I didn't have to. You know why? Because my silence spoke for me. Those guys who wanted to hear more about the word of God, they were questioning me. If you were giving them the word, they would have stuck with you. Case in point, very simple. Let's stick to the word of God. Let's stop thinking that we are above the people of God. We are all equal in Christ. We are all one in Christ. Christ never ever divided his body after he put it together after his crucifixion. He said we are all one. He never set up a Baptist. He never set up a Pentecostal. He never set up a Catholic. There is absolutely no scripture that you could show me where Jesus Christ said, Father, I have done your will. I have been killed, I was buried, and now I'm resurrected. But Father, I got to make a little tweak in your original plan. I don't want to make them one as we are one. Instead, just before you t ascend me to heaven, I got to put them in order. So let's get this group now. Now Matthew or Paul or whoever, you going to be a part of the Baptist. And Woody name going to be the Pentecostal. And you over here going to be the seven day. No, Christ never did that. You know why? Because division bring disunity. 
denomination bring disunity. You know why? I will prove it to you. Because you have some denomination who don't believe in speaking in tongues. The other one believe in speaking in tongues. Some don't believe that you should beat drums in the church. While the other ones, that's confusion. That is not of God. That is not of God. So the time you spend running on me, go back over your Bible and now use it as a benchmark finally to now see where the error is in this place that you call church. Because there's nothing I've said to you so far that is not pointing you back to the scriptures. That's what I'm doing here. All right. Now, let's go over here now to Roman, sorry, Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. And we're going to look at verse 13 to verse 14. Revelation chapter 16. And we're going to look at verse 13 to verse 14. And this is John, right? John, the revelator, he's having a vision. And this is what he's saying he saw in the vision. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. They were not frogs, but they had the image of frogs. But nevertheless, they were unclean spirits. He said, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. Okay, I got you. Verse 14. For they are the spirits of who? Devils. I didn't hear that. These spirits that he saw that gave the appearance of frogs are spirits of who? Devils. Good. Let's go back to our corresponding scripture. Uh, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. We say in the latter part, men shall walk away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and what? Doctrines of who? Devils. So who are these doctrines, are these doctrines of devils coming from? Well, it was just explained right here in Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, where he clearly says, for they are the spirits. They are the spirits of devils sitting in their evil kingdom and, and, and just manipulating the word of God to hand over to those that depart from the faith, that those who are arrogant, pompous, those who are self-centered and think that they, that church belong to them and not to God. No! Now, why are these people dangerous? Why are these people who talk about the spiritual covering, who talk about spiritual father and spiritual mother and master prophet? Huh? Boss prophet. Where does mess come from? My, I'm going to show you the scripture where this is utter dung. That's what the Bible called it. Dung. It is foolishness. It is foolery. Why we just can't keep it simple and stick with Jesus and follow his laws? Why we got to jump over all these hurdles to get to, well, not to Christ. You come right back to the same person who put the hurdles in front of you. No. No. It is unhealthy. This spiritual authority, this discipleship to man, uh, this unhealthy submission, personal shepherds, uh, covenant relationship. These things are not of God. Why? Why is this? Let's go over here now to Jeremiah. I give this give you this last week. Jeremiah 17 and verse 5. And what does it say? Jeremiah 17 verse 5 says, Thus said the who? The Lord, not the pastor. And again, I knock in your past. I tell you, all I tell you is who the speakers in these scriptures, you know, so that you will have a better understanding. It says, Thus said the Lord, Jeremiah 17 and 5, Thus said the Lord, curse. Listen to this now, curse. What is a curse? A penalty. What is a curse? A punishment. He says, curse be the man that trusted in man and make it flesh his strength or his arm or making flesh his head then. No, God said, yes, I put the apostle and the pastor. Yes, I put them there. But Kevin will show you their reason for being a part of the fivefold ministry, never to dictate, never to control, never to manipulate you, never to steal your life because that's what they did. Everything you had to wait, well, pastor, I won't get married. Oh, no, no, you cannot get married. I don't like that person over there. I, my, I, my spirit doesn't take to them. Really? What about God's spirit? What about my spirit? Oh, no, you shouldn't go to college because what are we going to do? God showed me a vision about you. I see you're going to be a millionaire. And so you just sit here, tell you 965. And hopefully uh, you don't die before me or, or me before you, sorry, and you wouldn't get the vision. No, no. Bishop, pastor, apostle, teacher, evangelist. The same way God have a plan for your life, he has a plan for my life. And guess what? You know what God said? Which now I know you ain't no rule over me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, right? In the latter part of that scripture from 28 going on to 31 somewhere. 
it says that he, because he foreknew me, listen to this now, this Jesus now, because he knew me well in advance, he has also preordained me to become conformed to the image of his son. So that means Jesus Christ, who put the gift of teaching in Kevin, who put the gift of dream and dream interpretation, who've given him the gift of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Kevin don't need a man to ordain him to become that. And that is why you're not moving in your gift because you're sitting in that pew. Boy, I hope one day pastor say, come up here, Mary. I ordain you to go out there and sweep the kitchen. No, 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 no. I don't have to wait on him. No, he was not the one that put the gift in me. Now, Paul told, I think it was Timothy, he says, now stir up the gift that is within you. So what I'm saying to you, the more you make these people your God, it is idolatry. What you should be saying is, Lord, what is it that you would have me to do? Let me, let me give you a quick example before I go to my next point. Some time ago, I was having a conversation with a particular uh, uh, leader, right? And they, they were telling me how they were following my ministry, blah, 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 all this other stuff. He started to exchange. And this particular leader wanted me to come under their ministry. Well, you know what happened from there, right? <laughs> so, so I said, buddy, I, I know about all of that. I, I, I am not here to, to vie for people's ministry. He said, no, 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 Kevin, man. No, no, I can, the Lord's speaking to me about something and I can deal with you on that. So I said, okay, do what you got to do. Because my mind was already made up. So anyway, that night when I got home, I spoke to my, my, my wife about it. So she knew my position. So I mean, I didn't even have to wait for what she's going to say. I know what she's going to say, right? So anyway, that night I prayed, I said, Lord, there's something that's not right about the situation. I said, reveal to me, speak to me tonight in a dream as it relates to this particular person. True story, true, true story. That night I fell asleep and I had this dream where I was in this home, but I was not familiar with the home, which represents confusion. You have any dream where you don't know where you are or you're being taken to a destination, you don't know where you're going, it speaks of confusion and God is not a what? God of confusion. Excuse me. Anyway, there were two naked women in this dream. And the two naked women, their faces was like it was erased. There was no nose, there was no mouth. And both of them are standing almost like mannequins. So the same particular church, this leader, not the church, this leader, he appeared out of nowhere. And he walks up to these two women. Now, in the dream, I could see these women and I could see this preacher, but none of them could see me. And this is what I refer to as spiritual insight. God is revealing things from the spiritual realm about a particular group, person, place, or thing that they would, that you would never know under normal circumstances. So he walks, I mean, he's like within six to seven inches of them. And both of them are side by side. And he says to them, listen what he says in the dream. He said, it is God's will that I sleep with both of you. So in the, I, 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 I look around and wonder if this fella had good. And, and, and again, I know this person very well. So he now comes just a little bit close. I mean, almost in touching distance. And he's looking both of them in the eye. And he has his hand down. And he's looking them. His hand is crossed. And he's looking straight at them. I saw him with all of his uh, rings and all these other bishop stuff or whatever, apostle stuff they were. And he looks them in the eye again. He said to them, he said, the, it is God's will. That's what he said to them now. Like in a preacher mode, he says, God's will that I sleep with both of you. And I woke up out of the dream. I woke up out of the dream and uh, I told my wife Deidre, but I said, honey, I love my God because God will always show me. I don't care much how man try to hide. God, as long as I honor my God and come to him and request of him, he will reveal to me. So now that God already showed me that, I have no more dealings with that person no more. I don't want to hear nothing but your ministry no matter where. In fact, what I have done since that dream was praying for their deliverance. And until I see that deliverance take place, then I'll, I'll have to cut that poison off. So what I'm saying to you, this is just another example. I didn't have to go to someone to say, well, what you think with this one? Or, or you think they real? Or, no, why would I have the same access to God as you? No, no. And that is why we have to stick to the scriptures. Stick to to the scriptures. Now, let's go to Mark. Let's go to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, and we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 13. Mark chapter 7, verse 1 to verse 13, right? 
But I also want you to put down Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 to verse 9, because they're basically the same scripture. Remember, I promise you, I'm going to give you a minimum of 20 scriptures, a minimum, for you to now do your study. So we're going to be reading right now Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 13, and Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. All right? I hope those of you who are watching me on Facebook, please, if you could put the scriptures in your feed. And I would also like for you to put uh, where you're watching from, okay? So Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, says, Then came together then came together unto him the Pharisees. Now, who were the Pharisees? We need to be clear in these stories. The Pharisees are what you have today. Pastors, elders, the leaders of the church, just who they are. It says, Then came together unto him, which is Jesus, they came to him, the Pharisees, and certain of the scribes, all church leaders, which came from Jerusalem. Verse 2 of Mark 7 says, And when they saw some of his disciples, which is Jesus, eating bread, they were defiled. This is to say, with unwashed hands, they found guilty. So it was the, listen carefully now, it was the doctrine of the church back then. The Pharisees and the scribes and those who were part of the church, this is a doctrine that they made up. This was not in the, the, the five books of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Let's be clear here. So the scribes and the Pharisees, just like the men, some pastors and leaders today, they are now, they are now dismissing God's commandments and they're now substituting it with their bylaws, their constitution and covenants and all of these things of demonic nature. So it says, they said in our Jesus, how could you sit with your disciples and you did not wash your hands? Are you out of your head, Mr. Jesus? This is an abomination. This is evil. This is wickedness. Now listen to this now. Verse 4, 3 says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, eat not holding, listen to this now, holding the traditions of the elders. Who are the elders? These are the older folks. These are the people who I just told you just now about the shepherd movement. These are the people that came together in a covenant and made laws that push God commandments out of the way and substituted with their own rules. So the, the Pharisees and the new pastors of the church back then they said, hey, hey, no, you cannot have a meal without washing your hand because it's the tradition of the elders. You all hear this? Now what is a tradition from a biblical perspective or from a theological perspective? It says a tradition is a doctrine believed to have divine authority though not established in scripture. Hello. There's no evidence from back then from Genesis to Deuteronomy where Anywhere God told his people after the Passover, after the drink offering, whatever, he said, he, nowhere will you find you have to wash your hand first. But these jokers coming up with their own rules. Now I'm breaking this down to you because I'm now going to show you the effects of it that it's going to have on you spiritually that nobody is telling you when you decide to follow them and not follow God. So he says, for the Pharisees, verse 3, and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, eat not holding the traditions of the elders. And when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, meaning that there were other traditions such as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. All of this was a part of their tradition. The table must be washed, the pot, the pan, all these other things. Forget uh, lying is a sin. Forget fornication and adultery. Forget all that. Don't worry about that. Just wash them pot. Now, once you wash them pot, you can go to heaven. So this is what they really say to you. So listen to verse 5 now of Mark 7. It says, Then the Pharisees and the scribes, who were the Pharisees and the scribes? Because we don't want to be confused. These are the leaders of the church. All right? This is your pastor, this is your apostle, this is your teacher, or your evangelist, or whatever. Then the Pharisees, verse 5, and scribe asked him, who was him? Jesus. They say, why walk not thy disciples according 
to the traditions of the elders. Is that all you have? Not why are your disciples not following the laws, the ordinance, and the commands of men. So you see, this ain't nothing new. You see, now this way back, over 2,000 years ago, right? You see the same devil, the same devil, the same uh, devil, uh, the doctrine of devil is still facilitating itself in nowadays, but under a different sheet now, and under a different covering now, and this is the, 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 the doctrine of covering. They want you to submit to that where the, the, the pastor or the leader of the church is the ultimate authority and everything must come through him and you must worship him and bow to him and kiss his pinky finger and all his foolishness. No, this is the same thing we're dealing with today. And my teaching is to show you God never instituted these people for you to bow to them. God never instituted these people for you to be led by their doctrine, by their gospel. God put these people in place to furnish you, to condition you, to teach you, to edify you so that you can now minister to the fellow believers of Jesus Christ, which is the body of Christ, which is a living organism. So it says here, uh, sorry, verse 5 says, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked, Why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders? But you all are here eating bread and stuff, and you all ain't washing your dirty hand. Verse 6 says, He, I love this, Jesus says, He answered and said unto them, Well, had Isaiah or Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, listen to this now, as it is written, The people honored me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Now, what does that mean? That means you will see all of the fancy stuff in the church. When you go to church on Sunday, the, the conductor comes up there. He does his regular stuff. Uh, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's a lie because you got us in bondage under the covering ministry. So that piece of your line already. He says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I, oh, I feel the presence of God in here. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, then the guy over here, the praise and worship guy, will play like three fast songs to get you in the mood. Then they can slow it down a little bit, but two slower songs. And then somebody can come in there and start jerking all over the place and say they feel God. That time everybody out there confused, broke, busted, disgusted, because the pastor now is going to come on and start a piece of tongue lashing. All right? Get up and serve your God. All week you out there work hard for man. Come up here and serve your Jesus. All this nonsense they're running on with. Now they begin to institute their rules. You all don't respect the pastor. The pastor stood up. Everybody should be standing up in here. What is this courting? See, what I'm saying to you is let's go by the rules. Why are you bringing up all of these unnecessary stuff that have nothing to do with the rules, the laws, the principles of God? Why are you so adamant about pushing your agenda as opposed to pushing the agenda of Christ, which entails pushing them to him? Verse 7 says, Jesus says, How, how be it, however in vain do they worship me, teaching, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. So you see what he's saying here? You hear what he's saying now? So God, Jesus is saying to these people, man, listen, what you are doing here, you are setting a bad example. But not only that, we are about to read that these things, these traditions, these traditions are going to take something away from you. Verse 8 says, for laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the, tra the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, Full well, you reject the commandments of God. Kevin is on the radio telling you, point the people back to Christ. Kevin is on the radio telling you, stop putting hurdles in people's way. Teach them about the liberty of Christ. Cause them to be modified through their members of fornication, lying, stealing, and teaching, and so on, by teaching them the scriptures, because only the scriptures could do it. Don't condemn them. This is what Christ is saying. Don't condemn them. Because in Christ's law, in Romans 8 and 1, this is what he says. He says, let there therefore now be no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ. So now it takes me back to the pastor who steps up on a pulpit. And because a member wants to leave or don't feel as if that particular church is, is, is building them anymore, it's stagnant. Why are you angry with the member? Why are you levying curses? Why are you telling they're not going to prosper? Why are you telling they will come back to this place? Why are you making statements that when they leave, you tell the rest of the congregation, well, who ain't here ain't supposed to be here? 
This is not your petty shop. This is not your mom and papa store. This is the living body of believers of Jesus Christ whom you should be directing to God, whom you should be telling them about the free gift of salvation, how to participate in the laws, the rules, and the commandments of God to produce the promises of God, not to make Mary turn against Susie because Mary does buy you shirts and Susie don't. Not for you to make statements about who does what for the church and the pastor and who don't. You are not called for to, to, to create division. You are not called to mislead people. The Bible goes on here in verse 9, it says, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandments of God, that ye may not keep it, that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso cursed father or mother, let him die the death. Verse 11. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Listen to verse 13 now, because this is what I wanted to get to. Because this is what the doctrine of men will cause to happen in your spiritual life that will now spill over in your physical life. So verse 13 of Mark 7 makes it very clear. Jesus now speaking in red. He says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which you have delivered and many such like things do ye. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus saying that the reason why your church isn't growing, the reason why you was building that church for the past 700 years, and you're still doing stuff to try to build it, you only got six members, nobody coming there, you, nobody is growing, everybody's getting divorced there, everybody dying from cancer, yet use the big great prophet, yet use the super duper teacher, yet use the super multiply by six prophet. You are all these things, but the evidence of the failure of your ministry is evident. Now why? Because God hates you? No, God loves you. It is because God got something personal against you? No. You know what it is? Because you instituted your tradition. You instituted your rules. You instituted your laws. And as a result of that, guess what happened? You all ready for this? Because I'm going to make it very visual. Jesus Christ says, I'm not invited here. So he walks outside of your church and he's sitting on the rock right underneath the tree. And he said, now whenever you all want to invite me back in here again, well then start practicing my laws. Don't you play with me. Don't you play with me. Don't you play with me. Because I'm going to bring the scripture which you need to do now. That is why the members are leaving. That is why they are fed up with church as usual. Because everybody is instituting their rules. Everybody is saying don't do this because pastor can get mad. And you know our pa No one is, is talking about the covering of Christ. No one is talking about delivering and, and, and soul saving. Everything is about what's going to make this person look good, how they're going to be perceived to this group. Everybody is hiding behind whatever. They don't want to speak out on witchcraft. They don't want to speak out on the, the secret society. No one want to speak about the coverings and that is false. You know why? Because they belong to this particular ministry. Oh, and Bishop so-and-so and his grace so-and-so, her grace and everybody else's grace would be offended and offended. What about God? What about God's word? Now you see people? Now you see what I'm talking about? I ain't knocking nobody. I am showing you where the commandment, sorry, the traditions of men has superseded the laws of the living God. And that's why they die in like crazy from cancer. They go to their head from Obeah. They don't know up from down, Alzheimer's, you name it, right in the church. Where Jesus Christ, listen what Jesus said. He says that, listen, these miracles that I do, you will do greater. But how come you ain't doing greater? Because you're not following his laws. You're not following his rules. You, you, you reject his commandments. That's what it is. You submit to your leader. Yeah. The, listen to me. I work for a private company, right? And in my private company, like most organizations right now, right? They have what they call a K, uh, KPI, Key Performing Indicators. This, this system is to reveal how you're performing in the company under your portfolio, all right? So there are certain things that they measure you by. The church is the first place in the world 
where the pastor could do what he want to do, the pastor could do what he want to do, and every year he can get pastoral hundred dollars pin on him, five hundred dollars over here, an envelope with six million dollars over here. Ain't no soul save underneath him. Ain't nobody delivered. Church as usual, but he's gonna be rewarded for that. I thank God for Jesus. Yeah, I thank God that Jesus is the one who give the real reward. I praise my Savior for that. People, again, I'm not knocking the church. I'm not knocking the pastor. All I'm trying to do is get your eyes open through the scriptures. God is going to judge all of us. We are not accountable to the pastor. You are not accountable to Kevin. You are accountable to God. So whatever doctrine of accountability, guys, under covering, it is false. It is a doctrine of devils. Your commitment should be to God. You should not be there. Well, you could keep sweetheart. You could keep sweetheart, but, but pastor ain't see you. So you could come, you could come church Sunday and lead the praise and worship team, okay? Because the pastor running on tradition, so he don't sense, he don't sense, he haven't discerned that something wrong with you, all right? So you live in your life, you're realizing that you, the, the enemy paving the road for hell for you. Because you figure, well, well, pastor ain't see me, and sister so-and-so ain't see me. And listen to you, listen to, your admission states exactly what you're all about. You are not interested in what God sees. You are not interested in what Jesus sees. As you, you figure, cause so to me now, I have to assume that you think Jesus and God and his kingdom are fictitious. Because you said, well, pastor didn't see me, but someone, the one who could destroy you is who saw you. And that's where your commitment should be. You shouldn't be, but I ain't gonna go to church because the pastor say they him and his wife them going on vacation this year. They go in Disney World and, and play with Mickey Mouse a little bit. So I see the need. I gotta come out. What do you mean? So so the is the pastor the church? Is the pa see all I'm saying to you through these examples? Very clear. I'm showing you where your commitment lies. That's why Jesus said in this same passage of scripture. He says, just like the prophet Isaiah prophesied years ago before, he said, they worship me with their lips or their mouths, but their heart is far from me. As long as they're in front of the crowd, they are good with their talent of praise and worship. They are good with their talent of preaching and spinning around and, and cabbage patching all over the place. But at the end of the day, they have nothing to do with me. In their dark corners of life, they engage in all kind of wickedness. But they come right back to church and put that false face on and act like they so Holy Ghost committed. You talk to people all kind of way, you treat them like dog, you undermine them, you wake old bear, you sweetheart, you cheat, you lie, you do all of that. But you know when Sunday come, you could you could you could live that that fake life. Like you could lift holy hands. Buddy, you won't fool in me. You won't fool in even the pastor. The only person being fooled here is you. And all Kevin trying to do is help you by getting you back to the word of God. Let the word judge you. Don't let a pastor who's limited vision only when you wouldn't see in the distance he could see you. He can't see you when you take a flight over to Florida with your boyfriend, girlfriend, somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife. No, he can't see you there. But you know who's seeing you? The one who could send your soul to hellfire or the one who could send you to heaven. And that's the one you ought to be concerned about. All right? So that's what I'm trying to get you to look at. Let's stick what what God is looking at, what God is saying, and what God wants. Now, the argument now has come where they were saying to me, well, Kevin, you ought to lie. Because the Bible says, I hear you talking about, but, but we shouldn't rule as pastors. We shouldn't rule. Well, the Bible tells us to rule. And guess what scripture they just run to? Because they're going to blast them out of the park right now. Let's go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 17, right? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. Okay? And listen to what it says. Let me just get some water here. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to give you some chance, a chance to look for it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Listen to what it says. It says, Obey them that have the rule, circle that word, go, oh, they love that. Ooh, we can see just what I mean right now. Obey them that have the rule over you. Listen what it says now. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give what? Account. That they may do it with who? Joy. That's what I read. Not with dictatorship, Hitler-style uh, 
uh, Saddam Hussein type tactics? No, no. So that they may to, to, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, let's go to the initial stages of the scripture. Now, God rule. We just read it. God rule say that we must obey those who are leaders because that's what the word rule mean when you look up that word rule in fact let me pull it up here on my i forget i had this in my mind. the word rule here where is it now because i'm because this this bible that i have they also have it in the greek and the greek and the hebrew so i'm going to pull it up again here hebrews 13 verse 17 and the word rule here, 13 verse 17, here we go now. Okay. The word rule here in the Greek, listen to what it means. In fact, it comes from the Greek word. I'm going to spell it because I know I can't pronounce this. It's H A Y G E H O M A H E E. Hagemogi. <laughs> well, that's what it sounds like. Now, listen to what it means. That word rule means to lead, to go before, to be a leader. Here it says. So it doesn't mean to control. It doesn't mean to lord. So when the scripture says here now, in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17, which says, obey them, obey them. Obey who? Obey your uh, uh, apostle. Obey your your pastor, teacher, evangelist, whatever. He says, now obey them that have the lead or, listen what it also means, that will guide you. Okay, now seeing that as the original rendering of that word, my next question now, lead me to where? Guide me to who? You see, because don't come now when you see the scripture says that you must have rule over your bishop and your pastor. You do it. We say no. That is not what it said. To lead and to guide me to God's word. And the day you stand up on that pulpit and you say something that is contrary, I ain't listen to you no more. No. Let me give you an example of it. Just to prove my point. If your bishop, pastor, apostle, teacher stand up on the pulpit one day and said, the church had a convocation and we've made some bylaws and rules. And we came to the conclusion that every couple in here was not married, but they've been together for seven years. The church now accept that as a legal marriage and you could shack up and do what you want to. Now, are you telling me that because that church is your leader based on the scripture, Matthew, I mean, Hebrews 13 and 17, based on that scripture now, do you, are you telling me or are you assuming that God is saying that no matter what that leader says, you must obey that leader? The devil is a liar. Why would God go against his laws? Why would God go against his own rules? So this is what I'm saying to you. The, the essence in that example is to show you this. When the scripture in Hebrews 13 verse 70 says, Obey them that have the rule of you or that are leading you, he meaning those who are leading you to the things of God, those who are guiding you as it relates to the laws and the rules of God. Now, Kevin, how do we prove this? Because this is a next scripture they like to throw on me to support this doctrine of covering, which still doesn't fit in. Let's go here now to Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, all right? And we're going to look at verse 11 to verse 12. They love to pull this on me. In fact, the apostle I was telling you about earlier, oh, he yucked this out. He yucked this one out in the one, but don't forsake the assembly. And, oh, I did you with my... But anyway, Hebrews, sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at it, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. So this is what uh, Christians call the five-fold ministry. All right? So every time you talk about the doctrine of covering and you say you don't need a pastor to cover you and you don't need a church to cover you, you don't need to be under that covering, they will say to you, oh, no, you're wrong because look, read it, read it. Ephesians 4, 11 says, and he gave some pastors and he gave some. Okay, let's read the whole thing. Don't let's read a piece of it. Listen to what it says. 
And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors. And he, who, who is this? And he gave. Who would he give? To the body of Christ, which is a living organism. That's us who believe Jesus Christ. Now that you've come into the, the covenant of Jesus Christ, God says, now these are the fivefold ministries who are to do what? Let's read verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Did you see bullying the saints? Did you see that? Did you see controlling the saints? Did you see telling the saints, is either no way, is either my way or no way? Did you see them saying here, Jesus says here that the minute that they freak out, tell them get out of here. Did you read any of that? No, you didn't read that. So after he said, you come into the body of Christ and these are the fivefold ministries and their job, listen, read, listen to their job description in verse 12 of Ephesians 4. It says, it's to, for the perfecting of the saints. Now. Less, yeah, for the perfecting of the saints. Why? For the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So myself, I am a teacher, all right? I am a teacher. This is what I do. This is what I'm called to do. This is what God has ordained me to do. This, I am doing what God had predestined for me before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians 1, uh, verses 3 and verse 4, all right? My job is what I do every Saturday with you. The perfecting of the saints to edify and condition you for your ministry. Hoping that the things that I'm preaching and teaching will trigger you, what your gifts are, will trigger you in your boldness to go there and now do what I do. Not necessarily teaching. You may be a singer. You may be a, a motivator, whatever it is. My job is not to lead you to me. My job is not to say, Kevin say, and that's it. No. When Kevin say, that's it, he's going to give you the scripture now. Because he's what, cause basically, his statement is predicated in, on the scripture. He isn't going to give you the traditional stuff where they throw it at you and then yuck any scripture to try. No, 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 no. That's not teaching. That's deceiving. So my job... Just like they have me listed in the five more full ministry, the last one is me, the teacher. And what is the teacher supposed to do? His job is to perfect the saints. That's what my job. My job is to perfect the saints. Now, what I want to do here, let me look up that word. Where's that now? Perfecting. The word perfecting here, right? Which is a Greek word. And that word is pronounced you know what, I can pronounce this because this sounds like a curse word. So <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can read it, I can spell it out. It is K-A-T-A-R-T-I-S-M-O-S. This is what the word in the Greek, this is what perfecting means in the Greek. Here's the meaning. It says to furnish or to equip. You hear that? So when he says that, Kevin, you as a teacher or the other one as a pastor or the other one as a prophet or evangelist is to equip is to furnish. It didn't say to bully. It didn't say to go up there and make a prophecy and say, if you don't give $100 to the prophet of God, you're going to die. That's not equipping. That's not furnishing. But equipping and furnishing me for what? For ministry. It says it next. Read it. It says it next in verse 11. He says, for the perfecting, which means to furnish or to equip or to give resources to, the saints for the work of ministry. So whatever I am doing as a teacher, it should never be to benefit me. It should never be to bring me glory. It is never should never be to say, hey, I'm the chief teacher. I am the boss teacher. I am the master teacher. I shouldn't be giving myself those titles. I shouldn't be doing that. What I should be doing is teaching the scriptures and perfecting or equipping or furnishing you or resourcing you with the necessary rules, laws, principles, commandments of God so that you can now go and go into your ministry. So at the end of the day, if you say, you know what, boy Kevin, I don't listen to you as much as I used to no more. I listen to so and so. I am happy. You know why? Because you already graduated from my level and now you're going to somewhere else. I shouldn't be trying to, well, no, 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 if you, no, no, you cannot go under Brother PJ. Brother PJ is a devil. You should stay with me. No, no, no. If you're saying to me, Kevin, I came into some new revelation. 
And, 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 and based on what you said, that tie right into that, and taking me, I say, man, look here, I won't give me some of his tapes. I want some of that too. But I shouldn't be, well, if you leave, <laughs> you know, you're in covenant. You know, I could cast a spell and make a couple cats jump on you and tell PCI. No, that's all bad. That's witchcraft. Why are you saying that? Why are you saying that? Any preacher, any preacher, any teacher, any evangelist, any prophet that threaten you because you feel it's time for you to go forward and they f f threaten you with, with, with those evil things, rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Father, your word declares that death and life is in the power of the tongue. Every evil word they said to me to that former church, everything that pastor said to my face and the behind my back or to other people about me for my downfall, Father, may those words never take shape in my life. Father, in fact, I pray for that pastor. Yeah, you said that we have to bless those that curse us. And it's unfortunate, God, because if they are a Christian just like me who made a covenant with your son to be a part of the living body of Jesus Christ, you said in your word, in Galatians, that we are all now heirs to the promises. So if that's the case, how could someone who's on the same side as me curse me? Don't they know your law, God, that because I'm an heir, just like Abraham, entitled to the promises that you said in your word in Genesis 12 and 3, that whoever curse me, you will curse them? Are they not aware of that rule? Are they not aware of that law? So how could you come up against another fellow believer unless you're not one? So you see what I'm saying to you folks, once we stick to the Lord, ain't gonna be no argument, you know, ain't gonna be no discussion, you know, and you're gonna sidetrack me. You don't go do that. You don't go come to me. Now that you said and all over you and you can't state your case no more, don't come to me now and say, well, he always rowing on the radio. Well, you know, he has his big head. What does that have to do with anything? We, we, we discuss in the scriptures. I remember him when he was four. Yeah, okay. How to tie into the scripture? So this is how the devil tried to distract you. When you don't wear them out with the scripture, all of a sudden now they get poisoned up. Can't tell him that need no everything. I never said that. I'm open to con I'm open to whatever you bring scripture for. So what I'm saying to you, don't let people, I'm talking for those now who are wondering about their gifts and so on. Don't let these people mislead you. Tell them, Pastor, I hear you know, and Pastor, I'm not disrespecting you. I believe that you're a man of God. I believe that you're a woman of God. But you made a statement, and all I want is clarity. I'm not here to cause argument. I just don't even tell him, Kevin, say, just say, just make this clear to me. What you, you said that we ought to have a covering. What does that mean? I thought Jesus was our covering. I thought he is all of us giving account to him. Why we have to give an account to you? I thought we are to be taught by you, instructed by you, counseled by you based on the scriptures. Tell him, explain it to you. But anyway, going back here now, it says to, to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, verse 12. Now, this is why he gave them these people, right? He says, for the perfecting or the furnishing or the equipping or resourcing of the saints. Why though? For the work of ministry. What does ministry mean? Service. What does minister mean? Servant. Like Minister Kevin. No, that ain't a title to make me sound big. Is exactly who I am. Minister Kevin means servant Kevin. Kevin, the Bible says, he that is greatest among you is a servant. And that's what I am. I am a servant leader. I serve you the, the, the scriptures. I serve you the laws. That's my job. I love doing it. I serve you whatever my gifts are. They were never for me. They were for you. To edify, to build. Who is this now? The body of Christ. So he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting or the furnishing or the equipping or the resourcing of the saints. Why? For the ministry and for the edifying or the building of the body of Christ. All right. So this is now where they come at me. Oh, yeah, you need to be under a pastor. I don't have to do what? Okay. If you're using the same scripture, well, why can't I be under a teacher? Why can't I be under evangelist? Why can't I be under a prophet? How did you determine and pick out of the five-fold ministry that have to be underneath the pastor? Where in the scripture that says that? You cannot show me that. There is no scripture that supports that. That is your dogma. That is your philosophy. That is your ideology. That is your hypothesis. That is your dogma. And all of that make it irrelevant and it has no standing. Give, just like how I'm going through the scriptures, 
come to me with the scriptures. When I have the open line after this, I will entertain no human if they're not bringing up. The minute you come on the phone and you're going to refute and you don't have the scriptures, next caller please. Because I don't have the time to, to allow the enemy to use you to waste my time. No, I want the scriptures, all right? So, I want us now to go to the same Ephesians. Let's go to verse 1. Let's go to verse 1, and we're going to read, we're going to read all, the verse, all the way to verse 10, right? And listen to what it says. I therefore, the person of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation or the calling wherewith you are called with a lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity, listen to this, endeavoring, he said, now you should make it a special effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Verse four of Ephesians four. There, there is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, Kevin, why are you putting emphasis on this? Again, again, let's dispel the doctrine of denomination. Again, I know this is difficult for you because this is all you knew all your life. But here's what I want to tell you. You are no different from the people that I sit with and they say to me, Kevin, I was listening to your show. And you mentioned something about it was wrong to mop your floor with type and time. Kevin, I did that. Mommy did it. My Grammy even tell us that on her Grammy. Kevin, you talk about burying the navel string. I don't see nothing wrong with that. See, we're not interested in what you see wrong, you know. We're, we, we're interested in what the Bible call wrong. So what I'm saying to you, I'm using this comparison because you could tote a culture. You could tote a belief. You could tote a tradition for years and sign off on it as if it's the gospel of Christ. So the people that do those things I just said, you are equivalent to those who practice a doctrine that have nothing to do with the scriptures. And the, and the, and the scripture says that the end result of that is that you will not see the hand of God operating in your life. So here it is now, he's speaking about one body, one spirit, one unity, verse six says, one God, Father of all, of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended in this is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven that he might that he might fill all things. Now, I want us to jump straight to verse 13 because we, we already read the middle part already, right? Verse 13 says, Till we all come, listen to this now, till we all come, till we all come in the what? In the unity of the whole faith. And of the who knowledge of who the Son of God, unto a who perfect man. But that cannot happen. This is my point. That cannot happen if the if the if the apostle or the prophet believe he's above everybody else. As a teacher, I cannot believe I'm above the one whom I'm teaching. No, God just pick out a teacher and a pastor. We all don't want to call you know, but He has now given me the mandate to teach, to instruct, to counsel, to advise. In the things of God, not to say I'm the chief in here and what I say goes, and if you don't like it, you can hit the highway. That is not a mind of God. That is not a mind of Christ. That will bring division. That's going to bring confusion and discord, and that's why people will leave your church. That's why people are going to leave your ministry and will continue to lead, and you will be in there preaching to the chairs and to the speakers and to the wall and to your art that you have on the wall and not people. Because they came to hear Christ. They came to hear how I am a Christian now. I want to modify this lust spirit. 
I'm a Christian now, but I love to tell lies. I don't want to lie, but I need to hear the word that will help me in overcoming this. I don't need to hear nothing else. Don't tell me about whatever else you want to talk about. You are a teacher of the gospel. You are a prophet. You are an apostle. You are an evangelist. Then your job is to furnish. Your job is to outfit me according to the scriptures in the event of preparing not only me for ministry, but for me modifying the evil members of this body that is still challenging the flesh. So no, 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 you are not no Lord of me. You are a servant, pastor, apostle, teacher, evangelist, whomever. You are a servant. Get that in your head. You are a servant. Serve the people of God. You are a waiter. You are carrying around a tray littered with the laws of God. And you're now serving them to God's people. That is your job. Not to lord. Not to rule. Not to dictate to them. No. Let me go quickly now because i got a couple more scriptures before I wind up here. Watch this now. Luke chapter 22. Let's go to Luke chapter 22 because, oh, there's more where it's coming from. In fact, I've been easy today. Luke, Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, and let's read from verse 24 to verse 30. 24, Luke chapter 22, verse 24 to verse 30, right? And this is dealing with those who believe that the title pastor means you are a king or a dictator or a jail warden. No, no, stop it. And that's why people turn off from you. Yeah, you make a preach good. Yeah, you might got good prophecy, but your attitude and how you treat God, people turning people off from you. Ain't nobody into that. We are all in one body, under one spirit, under one God. So Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 24, it says, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Now, isn't this interesting? Now, just to give you some history before the scripture, Jesus had just told his disciples how one of them is going to betray him and, you know, he's going to be crucified and all of that, right? And just like the regular people when you die, it, everybody will know who can get the house, who can get the car, who can be the leader of the family now. So this is exactly what's happening here. So in verse 24, it says, and there was also a strife among them. Not that Jesus, we don't want you to die. Not that Jesus, we want you to stay here. No, no, no. Okay, so Jesus, when you go, I can be chief? Or, or, or this, or uh, after Papa died, they left me in charge. He mean leave you in charge. Who are you supposed to be? Why everybody want to be in charge? Why everybody want to control other people's lives? Control your own life. And, and lead the rest of everybody else to Christ. So Luke 22 verse 24 says, it says, And there was also a strife among them, them being the disciples. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? Now listen to Jesus. Verse 25 says of Luke 22, And he said unto them, who is he? This is Jesus now speaking. Jesus says, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Listen to me. I ain't going to tell you all what this word means, but I want you to go look it up. That's going to be your homework. All right? Because they can show you what a benefactor in the relationship of one who believed they in charge, as opposed to being a servant leader. So Jesus is telling them, man, look here, this business about who can be in charge, who is greatest among you, you all need to relax on this man. Why everybody fighting for position? Everybody won't be elder. Everybody won't be uh, apostle and all. Why, why are you fighting for these things? First of all, if you are supposed to be an apostle or a preacher or whomever, according to God's plan, you are that already. Remember what the scriptures say, because he foreknew you, he also predestined you. He already said what you will be. He said, so you should be operating in that right now. I don't have to wait for someone to come put their hand on me and say, you are a teacher of the gospel. I understood my gift. I prayed to God. He told me my gift, so I started moving in it. I'm not sitting down in the church waiting till I at least ready to keel over to hit the grave for someone to say, come here, come here. Kevin, I know you're 78 now, but bye -bye. you're a teacher, go. Go and preach the gospel. I know two of your legs cut off and you know, just, just creep on the ground and preach to the, the snails them. No, 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 no. Listen to me. If God called you, he didn't call you when they ordained you. No, you were called before the foundation of the world. Galatians chapter 1 verse 1, what does it say? 
Paul said, in fact, let me read it, man. Let me put a pause in here, right here. Let's go to Galatians. I'm coming right back here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Because this is what the fellow tell me. Who ordained me? Who ordained you? He was upset because I said I wasn't ordained by man. He was mad with me. Why are you mad with me? Who ordained Moses? Where did they have the ceremony in the desert for Moses? After or before the burning bush? Get away from me. Galatians chapter 1 verse 1. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Paul, an apostle, not of men. That's what I'm reading. Neither by man. But by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. That's what I just read. I just read that. So what am I saying to you? Am I saying to you, go be a renegade and just call yourself apostle? No, I'm not saying that. Are you saying, Kevin, go be a renegade and go just set up a church and say you're the pastor? No, I'm not saying that. I am saying to you, if you believe this Bible, and if you believe that God is the Almighty who know everything, you know the end from the beginning, and you went and you seek God and said, God, what is my gift? What you call me to do? What, what is that you want me to do on this earth? And everything that you've been going through in your life has been leading you in one direction. For example, let's look at Joseph. Joseph's brother hated him. They did all kinds of stuff to him. But every time he was pushed into another obstacle in his life, he was always the leader of wherever they push him. When they put him in the hole and wanted to kill him, they, was, they sold him over to the Midianites who took him into Egypt. And what was he in Egypt? He was the head of Potiphar's house. He was the butler. He was in charge. After his Potiphar no good wife accused him of rape, which was not true, he sent to prison. Guess what they do him in prison? They make him the charge in charge of the guards. Everywhere he went, it was conditioning him for what he was called to be. And I'm telling you, I'm encouraging somebody right now. What is it? What is it? My life, my life, all of my life from the time I know myself, there's been attack from witchcraft. Someone I'm involved with, some girlfriend, whatever, trying to work stuff. I meet stuff to my front door. Stuff, all of the, I'm just like, someone trying to send me. No, this was God conditioning you to be, uh, this is your area of the gospel. So don't let nobody tell you that's all you talk about. Don't let nobody tell you, say, why are you bashing the pastor? Don't forget them. Forget them. You don't got time for them. That's, that's background noise. You follow Jesus Christ. You, every situation I've been in my life, Condition me for where I am today. And that's why I could stand in boldness. That's why I could stand in confidence. Why? Because of me? No, because I'm standing on the word of God. That's what supports me and that's what's backing me. So someone listen to me right now. Every relationship you go in is a problem. Every time you go to a particular job, God, what are you teaching me? What are you conditioning me for? Don't go to those friends you got there and say, oh, you got to send fire on them and kill them up. No, 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 that ain't what the Bible say. So at the end of the day, here's what I'm saying to you. Your consistent dilemma is conditioning you for a greater cause. That's all I'm saying to you. So let me wrap up right here. And I want to be true to my word because I've given you almost, uh, I've given you almost the, all the scriptures. So I'm just going to give you what I have here. Yeah, I gave you Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. And I gave you Ephesians chapter 4. And, and don't say I'm going too fast because you could, you could play the video back. It's going to be on YouTube later and on Facebook. So that's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. We spoke about Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. And we spoke about Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Then we're talking about the servant leader. I gave you the scripture already, Luke 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 30. Then we have Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28, all right? Then we talk about, well, we didn't get to talk about this, but I'm going to give you the scriptures, the denominations. I didn't go into details with that, but here's the scriptures that it is no more Jew, no more Gentile, no more born, no more free, no more barbarian, Cynthia, none of that. When Christ died, he died for all of us to make us one. So who were these people that instituted denomination? That's all. Now, if you, again, I know you can come after me. I don't know why. You need to go after the scripture. Go after the scripture. So in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11, we'll make it very clear for you. Then also in John 17, verses 20 to 22, where Jesus made us his prayer. You know, one of his, his, his ending prayers. He says, Lord, let them become one even as we are one. So that's Colossians 3 verses 1 to 11 and John 17 verses 20 to 22. And then you got to go, and this is your homework now, I'll expand more on this next week. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 
verses 14 to 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Then Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. Romans, Romans 10, Romans 10, verses 11 to 12 again. I know you're saying he's going too fast, but you can always play this tape back and get it. Romans 10, 11 to 12. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 to 27. 1 Corinthians 12 to 27. And then Galatians chapter 5, verses 6 to verse 14. And from the start of this, I've given you more than 20 scriptures. I promise you a minimum of 20. Now, next week, I'll have another 20 that will be totally different from this 20 here. And the, the last week, I'll give you another 20 that is totally separate and apart from the other 30 plus I've already, sorry, 20 plus I've already given you. Because, and all I'm doing is just showing you there's so many scriptures that are pointing you to the head of you as Christ not a man, not a woman, not a pastor, not apostle, not a teacher. Their job, as defined by scripture, is to perfect you, which means to outfit you, furnish you, to equip you, or to give you the resources, listen to what it says next, for ministry or for serving God's people and for also edifying the body of Christ. The word edifying means to build to add to the body of Christ through your gifting, through your knowledge of God. Not going to the body of Christ with a polluted message of covering. Covering is a doctrine of devils. Covering was instituted by these men, and, and I want you to, to go on, you, on, 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 on Google, and I want you to type in uh, the shepherd movement or the doctrine of covering. And you read it for yourself. And you don't pay no attention to nothing who was trying to support it without scripture. I've given you the scriptures, I was very fair. I gave you the scriptures today, so you can't come back and say, Kevin say, no, no, no. Say, Kevin say what the Bible say. So that's what I said. So everything I've given you so far, everything I've given you so far, I have supported it with the scriptures. That's all I did. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you for affording me this opportunity to do what you have put in my portfolio according to Ephesians 4 and verse 12, where you said that me as a teacher, a part of the fivefold ministry, is to perfect or to furnish or to equip the saints for ministry and to also edify and to assist with the building of Christ's kingdom on this earth. Father, I feel or felt that I have done that. And I thank you for giving me the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, and the spiritual insight where primarily I base everything that I have said on your word. I also pray and thank you, Lord, for giving me the gift of teaching to break your word down that not only, or that even a child could understand it, not trying to impress people with big words or to sound so educated, but to give them the simple truth and to remove the man-made hurdles out of the way so that they can go from accepting you and now sitting under one of the five folds ministry to now furnish them, to outfit them, to resource them, and to equip them for ministry and for the edification of the body of Christ. It will never be my desire, neither do I desire to rule, to lord, to manipulate, to beat down, to break down the confidence of others, which are your people. Father, your word has told me to lead your sheep, to guide your sheep, not to beat your sheep, not to embarrass them, not to preach on them from a pulpit and, and, and make all kind of evil remarks and levy curses on them. No, that is not what you call me to do. I am a traffic officer in the realm of the physical, consistently directing people to your laws, not Kevin laws. So Father God, if there's any form of, 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 of a, a haughtiness, pride, self, self-aggrandizement, bitterness, hate, unforgiveness, anything, lust, uh, anything in me that will bring me down, that will embarrass your kingdom, I humbly say to you, Lord, to remove that from me 
and even those who are watching and listening to me. I also pray, Father God, just like how I think Paul told Timothy, to stir up the gift in him. I don't have a gift to give them, but you've put your gift in them before the foundation of the world because you foreknew them. So, Father, I pray that those who are listening to me, that your Holy Spirit will work in them. And to now bring them a revelation or give them the revelation of what you have called them to do. And rather than them sitting up under ministries, not being profitable, and not executing that which you have called them to do, Father, I pray that you give them a spirit of boldness with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to move when you say move, to now bring others to your kingdom. Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, folks, that's it for me. Join me next week as we have another detailed, scripturally-based teaching on part two of the doctrine of devils. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.